Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Fancy seeing you here. Great to see you. Uh, it's been literally seconds since I've seen some of you. And uh, well done. I do hope the process from moving from one broadcast to the other uh, works OK. Um, huge thanks, of course, to Anna, who sends out all the links. Uh, huge thanks to KitKat, who also broadcasts them on, uh, puts them up on Facebook. Of course, if you are struggling to find us on a regular basis, remember the website will always show you the next stream. It's either the one that's going on right now or the one that's coming up in a minute. Uh, and sorry for the... I thought giving myself an extra five minutes would be enough but it's never enough you can always uh, spend a lot of time wittering when it comes to something as beautiful as the music of Henry Purcell um, so I'll give us a, just a couple of minutes folks or just a moment to allow everyone to come across from the other broadcast and uh, hope you're all very well Ben became Harry's famous warm-ups when we changed her <laughs> absolutely voice hurts from all that you've been singing bass have you Julie well that's quite a, quite the celebration I think you deserve it after submitting your paper but uh, so you're going from top C in the Allegri to singing bass and Purcell that's that's range for you that's very much range Lisa said the transporter's working make it so Lisa make it so fabulous excellent right everyone well Thank you so much for coming along. Now, Marion says she looked up aleatoric in the dictionary, in which chance influences choice of notes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, let's let's make a start, shall we, folks? Um, now, in terms of the, the structure of today, there is a structure, believe it or not, because I do plan these sessions, but it is quite a free and open structure. Um, our session is probably going to be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes today. And uh, this is the last in the current series of composing deep dives. Now, we are going to bring back uh, composing later in the year when we've had a chance to revisit some of the theory side of things. Um, so I'm aiming for that to be in the summer months. We'll do uh, some th more theory work. And then in the autumn, we'll actually look at some of the more rigid uh, compositional techniques that I would teach to GCSE students. That's uh, uh, that's those who are sort of 14, 15, 16 year old uh, for, for the rest of those who don't study GCSEs. Um, but I thought this was a really good topic to end on because we started six sessions ago looking at using a very narrow number of notes. If you recall, we were using the pentatonic scale, pentatonic meaning five, tonic meaning notes, so five, just five short notes, sometimes six, the hexatonic scale, and we were pulling uh, scrabble tiles out of a bag and creating a tune, uh, and from there we sort of just looked at how you at home can compose music without necessarily having to have years and years and years of formal training, you know, uh, the idea of pulling uh, tiles out of a bag was a good place to start using uh, sequences, using uh, muse score, and then serialism and minimalism, using small amounts of music to sort of create something a little bit bigger. Now, aleatoric music is something completely off the wall. And those of you who are uh, who are fans of art, and by, by which I mean painting, drawing, sculpting, and so on, I think you're going to get a lot out of this session. Let's talk about what aleatoric means, though. Okay, so aleatoric comes from the Latin alia for dice. And uh, so you see, I've been, as I've been saying, I've bought some special dice just for this session. Um, and so the idea is that Aleatoric music is what I was talking about a few sessions ago when it, it, we were talking about the 20th century and how music itself sort of broke apart into its various different components. Uh, and when we looked at serialism, you know, that was taking the, the choice of pitches sort of beyond instinct beyond training to a very formal rigid well this this is the order that we're writing and therefore this this produces the piece uh, minimalism was taking a very very small cell a number of chords for example and stretching them out aleatoric music takes away a huge amount of the formality and a huge amount of the prescription that comes with composing. So if we perform, for example, Purcell's Remember Not Lord Our Offences, there is a score that we sing from, and our goal is to reproduce as best as possible what's on the score. Um, and you can see and you can see and hear when you're listening along, that's the right note, that's a wrong note. And, uh, and you know, a lot of the composers and, and, the, and the conductor's job is to say, that's right, that's wrong. Um, and what that can do, and some of you I'm sure will, will agree with me, is that can be quite high pressure on performers. It can put a lot of people off uh, formal music making. So, oh no, I'm not trained, I don't, I don't understand it, so therefore I don't like this kind of music. Aleatoric music brings in an element of random chance. And uh, it's, as I've said here in the slide, it's very, a very loose term. 
it can cover all sorts of things. Uh, it can be everything from um, you just you have a, a basic structure, and and you you roll a dice or you, you you choose randomly which part of the piece you're going to play at once, or it could be simply improvise for five minutes. So everything from uh, ran uh, randomly jumbling up a piece to just making something up based on uh, a stimulus of some kind. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about it. Now, generally speaking, if you're playing something that is aleatoric, or if you're writing something that's aleatoric, generally speaking, there'll be two sort of areas that are randomised. Though, of course, it is a very open-ended, uh, uh, very open-ended topic. So you may, as I've said, be given a series of short phrases or excerpts and be told to put them in an order that suits you. So imagine, if you will, that you are a performer and you're there at your performance and you have a score with pages one, two, three, four, five, six. And the instruction is not to start at page one and sing all the way through, but maybe you say, right, I'm going to start on page one, then I'm going to sing page five. And then when I've finished, I'm going to sing page two and I'm going to sing page six. And just imagine the whole choir having complete freedom to choose which part of the piece to sing at any one time. Now, a lot of you sitting up say, well, that would just be mindless noise. And you could make that argument. On the other hand, you could also make the argument for the fact that the choir is singing the same piece, and they are singing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. And what is the right order? You know, that, that is the question. Are we setting out to compose a piece that sounds uh, sounds diatonic, that is to say sounds chordal and, and produces nice chords that all resonate together and give you that nice sort of warm glow like Purcell? Or are we trying to say something else? Are we trying to, uh, to express emotions, to express feelings that are deeper than can be expressed by a simple major or minor chord? And if you've enjoyed... Uh, a, a film in the cinema recently, um, if you've enjoyed anything that is even slightly angsty, chances are you've heard some elements of aleatoric music, certainly some elements of atonality. So structurally you may be looking at a different you know, different order, and we'll talk about some of that in a minute. Another way of looking at it is, is that you may be given a score that doesn't look like a score. You might be given a score that looks completely alien with symbols and shapes, what we might call a graphic score. And then the performer, that would be you as a performer, would be invited to interpret those markings, whether it was a simple line or whether it was a squiggle or whether it was a blob or whether it was something completely different, for you to interpret that score in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, and this, as I've said here, this may lead to interesting, inventive and highly visual scoring. And for those of you who I said who are artists, who draw, who paint. I know Kit Kat's a fabulous artist, uh, and that you will, you may feel um, moved to create a piece of music visually. Okay, and this this is why I think aleatoric music is so appealing to many of us. I remember when when I was at university, um, my my lectures on this topic were the ones that I was most fascinated by because it takes away the need to have any formal musical training whatsoever. You don't need to use any of the traditional notations. You can just draw a shape on a piece of paper and give it to a performer, and it's their job then to interpret it. So let's just quickly, before we, uh, before we look at uh, some of this in practice, let's talk about one of the main key figures in aleatoric music. He's not the figure, but he's certainly a very important figure. And this is Mr. Stockhausen. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of people will, will dismiss Stockhausen straight away. Uh, the great Thomas Pe Beecham uh, uh, was, was said, you know, do you, what do you think of Stockhausen? He said, not much, I trodden some once. Uh, uh, you know, not, not, not many people will, will uh, have his music necessarily on their, on their shelves, ready to listen to, but he's a really, really important composer. Um, not just because of his work with aleatoric music, but with electronic music, what we know as music concrete, which as you can see here from, uh, from the photo I found, which is using uh, sound and electronic sounds and, and creating new sound worlds. Uh, and again, if you've ever watched science fiction in the last 20, 30 years, you know, and heard anything that sounds sort of strange and otherworldly, a lot of that will be down to Mr. Stockhausen. Um, and he was hugely influential on uh, jazz in particular, on opera, choral and orchestral music. And uh, I think a lot of people 
<laughs> Marion said, sounds like Jackson Pollock's sort of art. You are absolutely right, actually. And if you are a fan of jazz, if you've listened to, you know, if you're, you're like me and you love Dave Brubeck and Miles Davis and, and so on, I would uh, I'd urge you to listen to Ornette Coleman. Uh, who was a proponent of free jazz and was was very much influenced by Stockhausen. Um, so let me show you a little piece of music. Now, this thanks to Anna, who sent this through. Um, so this is a piece of Stockhausen. This is Sounds in Space from one of his uh, Klavierstücks. And this is... Uh, this is what the performer would get. Now, I know you can't make the, the notes out, but, you know, printed out on a large piece of paper, you can see you've got different blocks of music to be played at the performer's discretion. And this is, the, one of the interesting things about this, of course, is that there is no such thing as right or wrong notes. There's no such thing as a right or wrong interpretation. It is how does the performer feel on the particular day that they're playing, and then that's the piece. And it'll never be the same twice, and it'll be a huge reflection of the performer's state of mind. Now, most of the time, if you go and see a piece of music being performed, let's say you, you, you wanted to go and hear uh, Bach's Goldberg Variations, a wonderful, wonderful piece uh, for, for harpsichord and or piano. Um, you may want, you may go and hear um, our, our, my friend Lawrence Cummings, fabulous, fabulous harpsichordist. You may hear him play it on one particular day. If you go back and hear it another day, it may sound slightly different. He may uh, play with the tempo a little bit more, but it'll still be the same piece. Similarly, you could listen to Glenn Gould play the same piece. It'll be a very different interpretation, but it'll still be the same piece. When you play some Stockhausen or you play some aleatoric music that's influenced like this, it won't be. It'll be completely different each time. And think about the, the nature of art, ladies and gentlemen. When you come across, when you watch a film, the film is the same next time you watch it. Yeah, if you if you watch 2001, you know, the, the same thing happens at the end. I don't want to spoil it. If you watch Harry Potter, you know, they don't make different decisions in the films. It's the same each time you watch it. Uh, likewise, a piece of art, once it's painted, for the most part, that's the artwork. But this is a different approach. This is, you take the music and you interpret it through the performer to create something new. And it takes the responsibility of the composer uh, to, to make those decisions, it takes those away and gives them to the performer. So it's much more of a relationship between the musician and the performer. Let's have a quick look at a couple more graphic scores, everyone. Um, so this is a really lovely one I found earlier on today by a, a, a great composer called Barry Guy. And he's got a great website with a lot of these absolutely beautiful scores. And you can see this is called Bird Gong Game. And I love it. It's written for an absent soloist. <laughs> so it must be a bass. Um, and, and what I love about it is that, yes, you can see there are musical symbols here. Um, and there, you know, there are notes and, uh, and directions, sotto voce and sostenuto and conspirato and so on. But there are, there's an awful lot of graphical, uh, graphical ideas and lines and colours and shapes to be interpreted by the performer. Here's another example of a beautiful graphic score. This is another Barry Guy piece here. And again, you've got uh, directions, you've got notes, but you've also got an element of art. And I don't know about you, um, but I would, if that was printed and up on my wall, I would have a hard time to decide whether or not to play it or just to stare at it, or maybe both. You know, it's absolutely fascinating and, and, and draws you in in a way that perhaps a traditional score doesn't. You know, somebody who has no idea of the, of the, of the, the rules and regulations of traditional uh, classical music could look at that and probably, if handed, a, 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 given a keyboard, could probably have a go at describing some of the shapes on that page without any knowledge of how to read music at all. And that's one of the reasons when uh, young people, particularly uh, those under the age of 10, when I work with them for composition, I tend to not use traditional staff notation. I tend to use graphics and shapes and colours uh, to inspire them. So they're not held back by those rigid fences uh, uh, and lines of traditional music making. Here's another example here I found on a, a great website, Sound UK, uh, and this is the background to an event specialising in graphic scores, and this is a graphic score. You can see there are uh, references there to the stave, but there are big, big blocks of colour and sound, and you as the performer 
uh, would have complete freedom to interpret that any way you like. I mean, these these blocks here, you can see, you know, five five blocks going down and getting smaller. Well, that could be descending in pitch and descending in volume, or it could be descending in octave, or whatever you wanted to do. It could be descending in sound as a singer. Ah, 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 ah entirely up to you as the performer and you know this is where we start to 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 move away from the idea that the composer writes the music the performer is the vessel through which the the composer expresses him or herself and the audience is the ultimate recipient of that and then they provide applause which closes the loop and therefore it's a, a nice virtuous circle here it's not it's not as much about the composer it's not even as much about the audience it's about the performer all right, that's one of the reasons why aleatoric music is so appealing. Just a couple more graphic scores. This is an example of a score that I used to use with primary school children. Um, and as you can see, this one is actually a little bit more uh, straightforward. You can see you've got stomp, 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 stomp. Thud, stomp, stomp, stomp. And you can start to see here that the, the graphics uh, and the images and the words are quite clearly indicating um, things for you to do but there's no sense of tempo. There's no sense of, uh, of texture, interweaving lines. Are all these things supposed to take place one after the other? Or could you make the case for, uh, for all of them happening at once? Entirely up to you. Um, just a couple more of these lovely, lovely scores. Uh, this is one called Cassiopeia, which doesn't have any musical shapes on it whatsoever. And yet, on the other hand, it looks extraordinarily close to music. You have these little sort of dots and shapes uh, with, with, with just tiny little markings indicating these are numbered. I don't. I know you can't quite make it out, but it looks like a, a join the dots image. And could that be perhaps you play note one, note two, three, four, five, six, or you can interpret it any way you like. And then one more here. This is from the Potter Museum of Art, and I just thought this was absolutely stunning. Really, really striking. This is a piece called Agglomeration for Violin Solo. And, um, well, I mean, as if any of you out there are string players, you can see the kind of shapes drawn here uh, on the page and all, all focusing on a single point. But as it moves out from that, you start to get shapes and, uh, and descriptive, uh, descriptive patterns and so on and sequences. I think it could be extraordinarily powerful to play. So for those of you out there who've never encountered this kind of music before, the thing that I want to impress upon you is... Uh, you have the right as a as a person, as a musician, as an expressive being, to create this kind of art. Um, it, it's it, once you create your painting or your drawing, what have you, incorporating musical shapes, it's then down to the musician you give it to to interpret it. So you don't have to have any clear idea in your mind what you want. You can express yourself completely and to the full, to the fullest, and then you give that to a musician who then turns that into music and it won't sound anything like what you had in your head and that's fine and that's okay and so it's one of the reasons why I was so inspired by aleatoric music and so just for the last few moments the last uh, five minutes or so of our session I want to just talk briefly about uh, how I approach aleatoric music and I found this beautiful beautiful image um, and I want to share with you when I was at university I was so inspired by aleatoric music I wrote a suite of pieces um, and I combined musical notation with art. I, I, I can't actually sadly find the piece that I, uh, uh, that I painted, but I painted something that looked quite like this with blocks of colour uh, across an entire page. It was a, a large piece, it was an A2 piece, of, uh, piece of, uh, of, of paper. And then I wrote some chords and I actually managed to find the chords that I wrote. Um, and these are they. There's the first chord. A uh, series of fourths for the most part. Here's another one. Here's another chord. And these were all, these chords were chosen with a combination of dice throws. Uh, 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 in fact, it was dice throws. So I, I would say, right, so what are the intervals here? And I rolled the dice and it came up with four. And so I chose fourths. Um, and so this, these are the chords that I wrote at university. And the idea was I printed this out on acetate so uh, uh, clear, clear plastic. And then the idea was you would place the acetate over the painting at a different point. And so if you put it in the sort of the dark red area up at the top, so something, let's say something like this, you put it up in the top corner and then played it, 
the colour underneath would, would be visible through and so that the colour would change the way that you played the notes. And so I had a sort of a dark red uh, and black area up in the top right hand corner and so that became quite angry and aggressive. And then the other corner was green and yellow and was, was, was much sort of warmer and reminiscent of home. So I played those same chords but interpreted them differently. And um, I'll be honest, it was one of my most successful compositions in terms of my marking. I got a first for my aleatoric project, whereas I really struggled with the with minutiae of, of hammering out, you know, the, the, the more traditional composition. And so the aleatoric side of things really sparked my imagination. And so what I wanted to do, folks, just to finish off today is to share with you a little bit of how I interpret this, this piece. And, um, uh, and and see what you think. Now, just to check your comments. So Karen says, I love them as artworks, but my head doesn't compute music. Well, that's entirely up to you. You know, the way that you interpret these pieces, if if you are moved to think of them as music, well, then play them. And 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 if I, if I can perhaps pass on just, just one little nugget of, of, of advice. It's uh, if you've learned anything across these six weeks, I hope you have uh, unlocked perhaps a couple of doors in your mind in terms of what sounds nice and what doesn't. Yeah, I like that, I don't like that. It is after all, all sound. And some sounds will reverberate and resonate together perhaps in a more uh, Im immediately appealing way to others. But what you'll find is even the most atonal, even the most unusual chords, if you play them again and again and again, will become familiar and will become comfortable. All right, so just, just bear that in mind. Now I'm going to just uh, show you here. Uh, I've got it set up. I have, marvellous. So here's my sequencer, and uh, in the very much in the style of uh, our wonderful UK program, Blue Peter. Here is one I prepared earlier. And what I did, folks, is I took these uh, these chords that I showed you, um, and just to show you again on screen, these these nice blocks here and I interpreted them in the following way. So I, I put up a nice uh, Rhodes piano and I played the chords in like this. So one chord per, per two bars. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two. So this is literally just block chords. I then uh, added in some uh, cellos playing on uh, every, uh, half that again. So. Just playing a little pattern, playing on the quavers, and one, and two, and. Okay, then underneath here, and these are all notes from those chords, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about how I chose those in just a moment. So I added then some nice phasing bells, why not? And so this is half again, so bringing in a little bit of my minimalism here. And then I thought we need some bass, so I then put the bass playing on the offbeat. So this is playing the lowest note of uh, of these chords, but on a very, very low instrument, coming in halfway through the bar to just sort of, just, uh, just put things slightly on the back foot. I then played in a piano here at half, at double again. So this is all to the shimmering sound based on these chords that I'd written. And then last but not least, a, uh, an interpretation of the chords played lower down on the strings. Okay, so these chords were originally written uh, when I was tw 24 years ago, uh, and I hadn't seen them uh, before this week. I then interpreted them in a moderately structured way. And so what we have here, if I play them all together, we have a big block of sound. Let's have a listen to it. So you, you get the idea. So we have uh, six instruments. We have six rep repetitions of the same block. And so here we're going to introduce the die and we're going to decide. So in our first block, how many of these blocks are we going to have out of six? And the answer is two. OK, two blocks in the first uh, repetition. And which two we're going to have? We count one, two, three, four, five, six down from the top. I roll the die. So four. It's going to be the first one, so we're going to have that, and we're also going to have 
six. So we're gonna have the string, so I'm gonna get rid of all the others, okay? So now the next one, we're gonna have four. And so we're gonna have number six again. We're gonna have, no, we've already had number six. We're gonna have number two. Number four, two, four, six, and five. So we're gonna get rid of one and three. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that forward. So this is now the second block. So how about the third block? You see this is all being chosen randomly, all six, nice and easy. So what about the fourth block? Uh, five in that one, which one are we going to leave out? We'll leave out number five, so I'll take that out. And you start to see that this is all being chosen at random. So in the next one we want five and we're going to leave out number six. And then in the last block, shaking and choosing, we can have five again. And we're going to leave out number three. And there is the... Oh, with police sirens as well. But that's, uh, that's just a little bit of extra uh, behind-the-scenes footage. So what you can see here is very, very quickly, you can start to put together a piece. And bear in mind, this is all just block chords chosen by rolling a die. And saying, right, well, so this is all going to be fourths apart, cr adding them into a sequencer, layering them up, and then deciding randomly, right, well, we're going we're gonna to leave those out, or we're going to add those in. It's all down to you as the composer. And I want to, to finish just with the thought to all of you that as composers, I'm going to go full screen, I think, as composers, you I, I think if you, if you can... Uh, I want you to, to break the, the link between traditional, classical, formal music training and writing music. Because it's not about that. It's not about producing a piece that ultimately ends up on stage at the Royal Festival Hall or Carnegie Hall or anywhere like that. Composing, for me, is about expressing how I'm feeling. And I'll be honest, every single composer who, whose works we see on our shelves and on CDs and so on, that's how they compose as well. You know, when Bach got up to write his music, uh, his his emotional state came out in that music. When you listen to the music of Beethoven, for example, if you listen to his string quartets uh, and you hear the difference between the quartets he wrote when he was a young man and had his hearing and the quartets that he wrote immediately following um, what's known as the Heilingerstadt Testament, where he wrote a letter to his brothers saying he, he was considering killing himself because he'd, he'd lost his hearing. And the, uh, the quartet he wrote around that time is incredibly dark and incredibly difficult to listen to. And then he had uh, a revelation. He, he, he felt reborn. Uh, he, he was uh, largely temporarily cured by a good friend of his who was a doctor. And his music reflected that emotion. And so for all of you out there, if you want to have a go at composing, please do. All right, I, I hereby, as, as, your, as your teacher for this course, give you permission to compose in whichever way you like, whether that is to pick up your instrument and play, whether that is to paint something that is reminiscent of music. It's a composition. If you have music in your head when you're composing, you are composing. And uh, I do hope you've enjoyed this rather off-the-wall deep dive. Um, we are back next week with something completely different. We're going to be looking at how to record and how to use this technology, I hope, in a way that will enhance what you do at home uh, and, and will make, I hope, the whole recording process substantially less stressful and of higher quality. Uh, so all around I think it's a virtuous thing to do. Uh, and so looking forward to, to starting that with you all next week. In the meantime, folks, why not get out a pen and paper and do a bit of composing later on? Anything. Anything's composition. There you go. So uh, thanks so much for being here today, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed it. And don't forget, join me on Friday for our fun Friday. We've got the Sacred Sing on Sunday. If you're in self-isolation, of course, we've got a very busy week with Messiah. And can I officially invite all of you, even if you're not on the course, to come along and hear the concert of the A Cappella Wonders on Saturday. It is stunning. So it's that wonderful Allegri Miserere, but also If You Love Me, which of course we're familiar with on this channel, uh, Loca Siste, again we know that one, and Crucifixus by Lotti, which is, I think, it's this year's Quanta Qualia. It is unbelievably good. I've heard it many times already. It's fabulous. So do join me for that if you can. But everyone... Thanks again for being here, and I'll see you very soon. All the best, folks. Bye-bye.